Okay, we left off, I keep getting my two glasses mixed up. We left off on page 1645 in the 10th edition of the Bedford. Um, Act 3, scene 1, we were in Hamlet's To Be or Not To Be speech. And I'm going to back up just a little bit from where we actually left off. I think we left off around 82. I want to back up just a bit. And notice, beginning with line 60, Hamlet introduces into this speech the idea of sleep. Okay, Where else have we seen Hamlet talk about sleep? Or an aspect of sleep. What do you do when you sleep usually? What happens to you while you're sleeping? You dream, right? I mean, that's the whole purpose of my, you know, Midsummer Night's Dream. He had that little speech where he was talking to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern and said, I could be a king of, you know, I could be bounded in a nutshell and consider myself a king of infinite space were it not for bad dreams, okay? So here he introduces the idea of sleep. He's going to then make that next kind of logical step to dreams. So he, he introduces the idea of sleeping in that he says to die, to sleep. Okay? It's an old, I don't know if other cultures have it, in the Judeo-Christian tradition at least, Dying is often referred to as sleeping. St. Paul uses that image throughout the New Testament. Okay? So-and-so is asleep in Christ. That means they're dead. All right? So, to die, to sleep. Then he goes on, line 64. To die, to sleep. He says it again. To sleep. Perchance to dream. I mean, if you're going to sleep, odds are you're going to dream. There's the rub. Why? Are all your dreams good dreams? Happy dreams? No, they're not. There are dreams that are troubling. So what about those dreams that one might have when one is dead that are not happy dreams? There's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come. Title of a movie, by the way. Robin Williams, Cuba Gooding Jr. If you've never seen it, strongly recommend you watch it. It's a great film. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil. Shuffled off this mortal coil means taken off our flesh. Died. The mortal coil, the language he's using is like when we take off our clothes to go to bed at night. All right? That dream must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. Look at your gloss for, what is that, line 68 or so? There's the respect, the consideration, all right? Lost my place. That makes calamity of so long life, that is, of a long-lived life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong. The whips and scorns of time. How does time whip you? How does it scorn you? You're all relatively young. Maybe late teens, possibly early 20s, but just looking around briefly, I don't see a gray hair on one of you. I don't see a wrinkled face. I don't see a saggy body. That's the whips and scorns of time. That's what time does to everyone. No matter how big of a Hollywood actor or actress you are and how much Botox and plastic you apply to your body. It's, you put Botox in one place, guess what? It's going to sag somewhere else. Okay, That's what he's getting at. That's the first thing, though. Whips and scorns of time. What else? Okay. 
There is a respect that makes calamity of so long a life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? Number one, who would bear the oppressor's wrong? Oppressors, the person who is oppressing you wrongly. Who would bear that? The proud man's concumily, that is, arrogance. The SOB thinks he is better than you are. The pangs of despised love. Despised? Unrequited. Everybody in here has experienced, probably by this point in your life, at least a little bit of unrequited love. Who would want to keep going on through that? He's asking. The laws delay. Why? Because there's a phrase, justice delayed is justice denied. That's why the Constitution guarantees what? Right to a speedy trial. It shouldn't be dragged out and out and out and out. The insolence of office, you've got a gloss there, of office holders. <laughs> Shakespeare's writing this in 1600. He is totally oblivious to 2018. Talk about the insolence of office holders. Okay. Politicians. In the spurns, the insults, that patient merit of the unworthy takes. That is, the insults that one takes of those who are unworthy to give insults. When? Who would bear all of these problems when he himself might his quietus make with a bare body? Pull out a knife. Mm. I'll stop and pause for a moment. If you've not seen it, look at the email I sent last night because this is National Suicide Awareness or Prevention Month. He is talking about suicide. Who wouldn't suffering these things, you know, kill themselves? Who would fardels, that is burdens, bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life? But, but there means except that. The dread of something after death. The undiscovered country from whose born no traveler Returned. Yes, that is where the Star Trek 89 or whatever the number of the movie was got its title from. The Undiscovered Country. From whose born no traveler returns. So, he's saying anybody in their right mind would kill themselves. But what stops them? Siri, right? What lies beyond the door of death? That's what stops them. That, whatever that is, that does what? It puzzles the will. The will is what part of your being? If you have no will at all, no volition, can you get up in the morning? No, you can't. It's that aspect of you that gets you up every morning, gets you going. Going through your daily routine, whatever that daily routine, even as insignificant, minor, meaningless that may appear. When you lose that will, that's when you, okay, it puzzles the will. Here he's talking about the will, how though? Maybe the will to... To end it all, it puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have. What ills? The scorn of time, the oppressor's wrong, the unrequited love, the proud man's contumely, the arrogant SOB in office looking back, all those things. Okay? It makes us bear those things rather than fly to others that we know not of. 
What are the others that we know not of? This is death. The only difference between real death and this, this has a window. We don't get to see what's really out there, right? Thus, conscience does make cowards of us all. Now, where could you argue, just on the basis of the play, that there is an argument to be made against what Hamlet has just said? That we don't know what comes, what lies beyond. The ghost, right? Was Hamlet merely hallucinating? Was Hamlet, Horatio, Marcellus, Bernardo having a common dream like the four lovers in Midsummer Night's Dream? I don't think so. They all saw him. They all heard him. Okay. The ghost said what? Every day I do what? During the daylight I have to go back to a place of fire and purgation. Huh. Isn't that part of, however, the thing that puzzles the will? I don't know. If I go through this door, I don't know which door I will go through. Because if you take the religious ideology that's given in the play, there's three possible doors, right? Heaven, purgatory, And thus, the native hue of resolution. What's the native hue of resolution? What is it? Let me think how to describe this. Here's one. Because of some necessity, you have to move a really heavy weight. That is, the weight might not be a thousand pounds, but it might be for your strength level and your weight really heavy. What happens to your face when you go to either lift that thing, your car breaks down in the middle of the road, like old Ford Parkway, and you've got to get out and push it over to the side. What happens to your face? Especially if you're pale white. Turns red. That's the native hue of resolution. You're struggling. Okay. Here, the resolution is what? What might the person who has suffered all of these things resolve to do? <coughs> I'm kill myself. There's no reason to go on. So what happens? Conscience makes cowards of us all. In the native hue of resolution, that resolve, that you're firm, you get really angry at somebody, and you're getting ready to just beat the living daylight, you turn red. The native view of resolution is sickly or with the pale cast of thought. Sickly or all the color drains from the face. Why? Well, maybe I shouldn't do this. If I do this, what are going to be the repercussions? What are going to be the consequences? If I shoot this person, I might get caught. If I rob this bank, I might get caught. If I don't study for this exam, I might get caught, you know, so to speak. In enterprises of great pitch and moment, your gloss, pitch, height, as of a falcon's flight, moment, importance, okay? The pitch, falcon's height, doesn't really help you much, right? He means of great significance, enterprises, goals, jobs, plans, Okay. What happens to those things? With this regard, what regard? Thought, conscience. Their current turn awry. Current, what does current mean? Like the word career. It means flow. The flow of something. So, your flow, your resolve has set something into motion. And then what happens? 
you start to think about it. And that motion turns. It doesn't achieve its goal and lose the name of action. Because if you don't do the thing you were planning to do, what are you now doing? Nothing. Nothing. And then he goes, oh, look, Ophelia. Is that because he's just now seeing Ophelia? Or is this Hamlet telling us, the audience, I knew she was there all along. And so this is meant for her to hear. Big question. Is Hamlet aware that Polonius and Claudius are also somewhere within earshot? So he goes up to her. Nymph, in thy orison, your prayers be all my sins remembered. Don't, don't you have to ask somebody to pray for you? Isn't it more likely you, you want them to forget those things? <laughs> like God be merciful to someone? That doesn't mean, you know, don't be just or anything. It just means shower your love upon that person. Ophelia, good my Lord, how does your honor for this many a day? Why does she ask him? How are you doing for these many days? Well, she's listened to her father, right? She has shut up all communication between them. So she hasn't talked to him. Well, I believe, thank you. Well, well, well. Well, my Lord, I have remembrances of yours that I have longed, longed to re-deliver. So she pulls out of a pocket something, letters. Things to give back to him. Hamlet, not I. I never gave you up. My, my honored Lord, you know right well you did. And with them words of so sweet breath composed has made the things more rich. In other words, when she's getting ready to hand these back, what is she saying about these same things she's getting ready to hand back? Are you honest, my lord? Are, are you fair? Okay, your gloss for honest. Are you honest meaning truthful and chaste, and fair meaning just and honorable and beautiful? Are not mere quibbles. The speech has the irony of a double entendre. So go back. Are you honest meaning truthful and chaste? Are you fair meaning just and honorable? Well, she's like... Over my head, what are, you, what are you talking about? That if you be honest and fair, your honesty should admit no discourse to your beauty. Well, couldn't beauty have any better commerce than with honesty? That is, according to one way of thinking, should the beautiful person also be honest? Plato taught 2,500 years ago, if you were beautiful on the outside, guess what that showed? You were also beautiful on the inside. Therefore, if you were ugly on the outside, you were also ugly on the inside. How shallow can you be for someone who was pretty deep in his thinking? He says, yeah, for beauty will sooner transform honesty. Remember, honesty was glossed as truthfulness and chastity from what it is to a bod. We've seen that word bod three or four times now. It's a pimp. Beauty will do what? Will transform honesty and use it as a pimp. Beauty is what? Flesh. Honesty is the virtue, the power to use that flesh for good ends, not licentious ends, let's say. I did love you once. You made me believe so. You shouldn't have believed me. Is this a me too moment? You shouldn't have believed me. For virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. Our old stock, the old Adam, the pre-Christian person within the Judeo-Christian tradition. Virtue can't what? Line 115. Inoculate. Graft. Virtue.
dirt you can't take the old stock, the old Adam, fallen Adam, and somehow engraft something virtuous on top of it. I loved you not. I was the more deceived. What does she mean by that? Two things, really. One, Tam. Two, I believed you. She fell in love, too. Get thee to a nunnery. Notice, Shakespeare, man, nunneries are important. <laughs> because what did Theseus tell Hermia? Well, if you don't marry Demetrius and I don't kill you, you're going to have to become a nun. Get thee to a nunnery. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? That goes back to the old stock idea. It also goes back to his speech to Polonius, let not your daughter walk in the sun. Why? <laughs> Conception's a wonderful thing, but you don't want her to be a breeder of maggots. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? I am myself indifferent, honest, but yet I could accuse me of such things. It were better my mother had not borne me. We, we who? He says, we are errant knaves all. Believe none of us. Men. That's what Hamlet's saying. Men are errant. Errant means wandering. And what he means by that, and I'm not, you know, don't mean to be abusing or whatever. You mean. That means they go from one flower to another flower to another flower to another flower and all the rest, all the flowers. They don't settle on one. That's why he says. Believe none of us. If another man tells you he loves you, don't listen. This is now the third man who's told her. Don't believe you. Don't believe it if someone says he's in love with you. Go thy ways to a nunnery. Where's your father? At home, my lord. Why do you think he asked that question? And what did she just do? She lied. She lied. What could she have said? Over my hairs. But she lies to him instead. So what does Hamlet now know or believe? Okay, what else? She's in on it. She's in on the plot. There's just a, you know, check mark on another <laughs> name of someone not to trust. Let the doors be shut upon him. That he may play the fool nowhere but in his house. See, and this is another reason why I think Hamlet knows where Polonius is. He says this within earshot of Polonius. What is he saying? Old man, mind your own business. Stay inside your house. Oh, help him, you sweet heavens, she cries out. If thou dost marry, that is, if you don't take my advice and go to a nunnery, I'll give thee this plague for thy dowry. Be thou as chaste as ice, as pure as snow. Thou shalt not escape calumny. Okay, that's not a prophecy, and it's not a, a not prophecy not the right word. It's not a um, curse. He's saying, however chaste you are, however pure you are, you won't escape calumny. What's calumny? Blame. People will still say X, Y, and Z about you. Cue the modern situation with the Supreme Court nominee. Get thee to a nunnery. Go. He means, like, right now. 
<laughs> Leave my presence and go to, a, go to a convent. For if thou wilt needs marry, marry a fool. For wise men know well enough what monsters you make of them. You who? Before I said the, the we reply, reply, the we refers to us men. So who does the you refer to? It's not just Ophelia. It's all women. And Shakespeare is playing upon a medieval Renaissance notion that guess what, guys? Your woman isn't going to be faithful. Why? Again, a medieval Renaissance notion that women's sexual desires could not be satisfied. Period. So, not by one man. And when he says they make monsters of you, he's playing upon the old idea of the cuckold. Okay? The guy whose wife's been unfaithful to him, and therefore he has horns on his head. And so in a lot of Shakespeare's plays, You'll hear people referred to as having horns on their head. There was even a line in Midsummer Night's Dream that I didn't discuss. Okay? Go. Go to the nunnery. Oh, heavenly powers, restore him. Okay, so help him, sweet heaven, <clears throat> heavens. Heavenly powers, restore him. What is she saying about Hamlet in both those statements? He's lost his mind. Something has happened to him. He needs help. He needs healing. He says, I've heard of your paintings too. What are you talking about paintings? Look at your gloss, line 136. Your, where is it? Monsters. What the hell does indefinite use mean? That is a just utterly asinine clause. Paintings refers to makeup. I've heard about your paintings. And he played Shakespeare plays on this notion in the sonnets also. That with makeup, what? You could turn something ugly pretty. Okay? I've heard about your paintings too. Well enough. God has given you one face, that is, the face you're born with, and you make yourselves another. You jig, you amble, and you lisp. Jig, like you dance. You, you do these things to attract men. You nickname God's creatures and make your wantonness your ignorance. Go, I'll know more on it. <laughs> and Hamlet leaves. Ophelia is alone on the stage other than Polonius and Claudius behind the heiress. And she gives us this little speech. Oh, what a noble mind is here overthrown. The courtiers, soldiers, scholars, eye, tongue, sword. That is, Hamlet is the model. He is the ideal for the courtier, the soldier, the scholar, in their eye, their tongue, their sword. Their eye, what they see and understand. Their tongue, what they say and speak. Their sword, their martial ability. The expectancy and rose of the fair state. Expectancy, he's going to be king after Claudius. The class of fashion. This is the guy who would be you know, slathered all over the models magazine covers. He'd be the one raking in, you know, 50, 60, 70 million dollars a year. He's the one that everybody walks into a room, whether you're a man or a woman, they just go, oh, so handsome. You know, the men, it's not fair, and the women, please pick me. The glass of fashion, the mold of form, and there's the line. The observed of all. She's telling us two things there. One, everybody seemingly in Denmark, what? Puts this where? <clears throat> this, literally, where it doesn't belong. They stick their noses in other people's business. They spy. They will watch everybody else. 
violating what we've talked about already. You know, when Hamlet tells Horatio, it is a moat to trouble the mind's eye, violating what Jesus says in that parable about before you try to take the speck of dust out of somebody else's eye, remove the beam from your own eye. Well, they're all looking at everybody else's eyes and not paying attention to their own beams. Quite, quite down. He should be up here and she, he's on the ground, she suggested. And I, a lady's most deject and wretched. Dejected meaning sad, yes. Also meaning what? The D and re have the same meaning. Rejected. And that's why she's wretched. That suck the honey of his music vows. His pretty poetic protestations of love, she says. She sucked the sweetness right out of those suckers. She believed him hook, line, and sinker. Now see that noble and most sovereign reason, like bells jangled out of time and harsh. What did Hamlet say? Time is out of joint. Oh, wretched spite that I was born to set it right. That unmatched form and feature of blown youth blasted with ecstasy. What is an ecstasy literally? You can spell it that way, or you can spell it, some spell it this way. It is not a date rape truck, even though it is today a date rape truck. What else is it? It is an out-of-body experience. It's when the mind leaves the body. She's saying, Hamlet's mind is clocked out. She's crazy. So... Put on an antic disposition. Woe is me to have seen what I have seen, see what I see. To have seen what I have seen. Past tense. When? When Hamlet was in fair form. When Hamlet was at the height of his abilities. She was like, oh, ladies, you should have seen him. To see what I see, what he is now. And there... What does she mean by see? She doesn't only mean see with these. To perceive, to understand what I now know to be the case. King comes in. <laughs> love? No. No, he is not. He's not crazy for love. That's not it. Nor what he spake, though it lacked form a little, was not like madness. Nah. There is something in his soul over which his melancholy sits on brood. His melancholy, his depression. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hands or anything, but how many of you have been depressed before? And what feels best when you're depressed? To just dig that hole deeper. Listen to sad music. Think of sad things. Rehash whatever the argument was that might have started the depression. You know, it's the proverbial pity party. That's what Hamlet's doing, according to Claudius. And I no doubt, I do doubt the hatch and the disclose will be some danger. That is, and when this thing erupts, watch out. Therefore, we're going to send him to England. Okay? So, Polonius, what do you think? He goes, okay, that's a good idea, but I still think it's because of love. I still think it's because I told Ophelia to... Ignore him. <clears throat> so, how now, Ophelia? You need not tell us what Lord Hamlet said. We heard it all. So, where were they? The very fact that Polonius says we heard it all tells us, audience, what? It was not a soliloquy. Okay. It can't, by definition of soliloquy, it can't have been. So, the king says, um, look, excuse me, back up. Polonius says, let us wonder the 
opening and confront him. And I'll position myself where I can what? Listen in. Okay? Now, he heard Hamlet, right? What did Hamlet say? Tell your father to lock himself in his house, close the doors. How could that be construed or, or interpreted? And now he's saying, I'm going to mess with Hamlet and his brother. <laughs> I'm going to go listen to a conversation between himself and his mother. Shouldn't this be kind of sacred? Like confessor, you know, confessant and priest, or patient and psychiatrist? King, you do what you want. Madness and great ones must not unwatch go. Why not? Why shouldn't mad ones in madness in great ones not go unwatched? Well, if they are truly great, then what kind of effects can their madness have? Great effects, right? Say what you will about it, and I'm not a supporter of them, don't get me wrong. So I, you know, probably gonna get. Some tweet, ah, oh, Sherman's an all right, you know, Nazi sympathizer. Hitler was great in the sense of his, how do I put this? Goals and desires for the German people in wanting to raise them out of the depression. Okay? He was not great in his means, he was not great in his ideology. But he was great in that you can't be a loser and have millions, literally, of people at rallies chanting your name. But Hitler was also what? Bat, you know what, mad, crazy, insane. Okay? That's why you don't let <laughs> madness in great ones go unwatched. You know, if only the stupid Vienna art school had accepted him, then he probably would have become one of the greatest painters of the 20th century. If you ever looked at his paintings, he was amazing, an absolutely amazing artist. But he was turned down, and he went from there into you know, <coughs> utter loony bin world. So, we see Hamlet. Hamlet talks to the first player, or to the players, and notice what Hamlet said. I'm not, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we don't have the time. But what is Hamlet telling the actors? Don't mess up the play. I am going to spend time. He says, speak it as I pronounced it to you. Trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, I had his leave the town... Say it how I told you to say it. Now, I and a whole lot of others think, this is Shakespeare. This is Shakespeare, the writer of the play, telling the actors, you are not free to do with my lines what you think you are free to do. You do my lines the way I tell you to do my lines. Why? They're my lines. This is my play, buddy. Don't mess it up. Okay? Nor do not saw the air too much with your hands. If you saw the Shakespeare in the part thing for the extra credit, what was one of the things that characterized Bottom the Weaver? Even when he wasn't acting the part of Pyramus, he's moving his hands all over. That's not acting. Acting comes from where? It comes from in here, it comes from the voice, and it comes from the facial expressions. For in the very torrent tempest, and as I may say, whirlwind of your passion, you must acquire and begin a temperance that may give it smoothness. It offends me to the soul to hear a robustuous, periwig painted fellow tear a passion to tatters, to very red, to tear a passion to tatters. I don't have any evidence of this, but I think Hamlet is talking about, slash Shakespeare, is talking about the portrayal of Bottom in the play of Pyramus and Thisbe. 
Because what does Bottom do? He takes that suicide scene, right? And in every production I've seen, it's not just, oh, I died, thus, ugh, thus, ugh, thus, ugh, and then he falls on the stage. What does he do? He milks it. He did little scene, which should take 20, 30 seconds, according to the text. Takes five minutes. And then Fisby comes out and does the exact same thing. Okay? <coughs> so, Hamlet says, okay, be not too tame, neither. But let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action. Why? So that anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing, that it's acting. And then Hamlet tells us what is the purpose of acting. What are, what are the reasons for plays? As twere, is to hold as twere the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time, his form and pressure. So, if you think of this as being a mirror, the purpose of the play is for a giant mirror to walk out on the stage and go, look at yourselves. Because when you see bottom, you're seeing an aspect of your own personality. When you see Hamlet, you're seeing an aspect of your own personality. And it is to do what? To show virtue her feature. This is a good way to behave, act like this. Scorn her own image. Don't be a fool. Don't act like bottom. And to show the time its own way. Okay? So the player says, don't worry, we got it. All right? So Polonius comes in. And let's see. We'll skip a bit. The king and Gertrude and others come in. Hamlet um, is there. And let's see here. The queen goes, Hamlet, come sit by me. Bottom of page 1650. Hamlet, no good mother. Here's metal more attractive. Metal Talking about Ophelia. How can metal be attractive? Well, get a magnet. He's saying, like, she's drawing me to her. Okay? Polonius, look, my daughter again. You see that? Hamlet, shall I lie in your lap? Lies down at Ophelia's feet. Doesn't mean he's lying in her lap, but he says, shall I lie? In your lap. He lies down on her feet. In most of the productions I've seen, he puts his head in her lap. Okay? Bear in mind a couple things. If Shakespeare can make use of a situation to make it um, not, to make it covertly dirty, okay, raunchy, he will. He'll never pass up that opportunity. Two, he never met a pun he didn't like. If he could pun on something, he will. Okay? So, shall I lie in your lap? No, my lord. I mean, Ophelia's going, oh, I'm a, I'm a good girl. I don't do those things. Okay? Hamlet, I, I mean my head upon your lap. You know, notice, head can have two meanings, right? I, my lord. Do you think I'm at Country Manners? And your gloss tells you, with a body pun. Yeah, well, just saying with a body pun doesn't say enough. Because you need to know, in Shakespeare's day, I used to be an um, assistant editor to this major publication, collected poetry, uh, an edition of the collected poetry, John Donne, who was a contemporary of Shakespeare. And so I would read manuscripts, 17th century manuscripts, whether a microfilm or go to the libraries where they are. And the word country shows up in a lot of Dunn's poetry, as it does in Shakespeare. And I would say 
Oh, 50% of the time, at least. 50% of the time, country is spelled that way. Okay? So when Hamlet says, you think I meant country matters? And there is some reason to believe it would be pronounced country, that is, slight pause between the two. And notice what Ophelia says. I think nothing, my lord. Okay. Hamlet brings up a shoulder surgery last year. It's still not perfect. Um, Hamlet brings up country. She says, I think nothing, my lord. Hamlet, that's a fair thought to lie between leg, maid's legs. She goes, what is my lord? Nothing. What? How can nothing lie between a maid's legs? Well, how do you represent nothing? Okay. Like I said, if Shakespeare can find a dirty aspect to a situation, he will. I mean, if you're going to ban Shakespeare from schools, at least do it for the good stuff, not for the <coughs> other stupid things. So, what is my lord? Nothing. Ophelia, you are merry, my lord. Who I? I, my lord. Oh, God, you're only jig maker. What should a man do but be merry? For look, you are cheerfully, my mother looks, and my father died within. I mean, why shouldn't I be married? Dad's dead. Mom got married two hours later. Hey, eh, tis twice two months, my lord. But when the play opened, Hamlet says it wasn't yet two months. Have two months passed since then? Have we ever been told? Meanwhile, six weeks later, nope. We don't get indications necessarily of the passage of time, but apparently some time has passed. Hamlet, really? Two months? And he hasn't forgotten yet? Then there's hope. A great man's memory and he outlived his life. So, the dumb show comes in and let's see. The player king does his bit and we see the king lie down and we see the poison poured into his ear. And Hamlet tells them it's called the murder of Gonzago. And the king gets up quickly and leaves. Hamlet, what, frighted with false fire? So they all leave at Hamlet and Horatio. And Hamlet says, you see, you see what happened? Okay. Horatio leaves. Rosencrantz and Gildenstern come in. And they want to talk with him. They tell him that his mother wants to talk with him, and let's see here. The players come in with recorders, <clears throat> recorders like these kind of recorders, okay? Hamlet grabs one from one of them, and Hamlet tells Gildenstern, will you play upon this pipe, line 314? Gild I, I cannot. I pray you. B believe me, I cannot. I beseech you. I know no touch of it, my lord. That is, I don't know how to make sound come out of it. Well, this is easy as lying. Right? How easy is it to lie? Uh, pretty easy. Govern these vintages with your fingers, these holes, and thumb. Give it breath with your mouth, and it will discourse most excellent music. Look, these are the stops. But these cannot I command to any utterance of harmony. I have not the skill. Why did Hamlet grab the recorder? So that he could give us this next little speech. Why look you now, how unworthy a thing you make of me. You would play upon me. You would seem to know my stops. You would pluck out the heart of my mystery. You would sound me from my lowest note to the top of my compass. And there is much music. Excellent voice in this little organ. Yet cannot you make me speak. What's he just accused Gildenstern and Rosencrantz of? You think I'm like a stupid little wing flute. <clears throat> you think you're going to come in here and you're going to press the right buttons, you're going to say the right things, 
and you're going to get me to spill everything that's in me? It's blood. Do you think I am easier to be played on than a pipe? Call me what instrument you will, though you can fret me like a guitar fret, you cannot play the part of me. What's Hamlet telling you? I am so far out of your league, boys. <laughs> Just give it up. So Polonius comes in. The queen wants to speak with you. Right? Hamlet says, I'll go. They all leave but Hamlet. Hamlet tells us, it is now the very witching time of the night. The gloss tells you, the time when spells are cast. What other time is it? It's near midnight. When does the ghost usually appear? Near midnight. Okay. Hamlet says, when churchyards yawn and hell itself breathes out contagion to this world. Now could I drink hot blood, going against all the Old Testament law, okay, and do such bitter business that the day would quake to look on. In other words, oh, first of all, I could kill that dirty SOB right now. Oh, but soft to my mother. And what the dead say, don't do anything to your mother. Okay? Scene three. The king's talking to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. He goes, I don't care for this. You guys are going to take a meeting for me. They say they will. They leave. Polonius comes in. He's going to his mother's room. I'll hide myself there. I'll talk to him. Polonius leaves. The king gets a soliloquy. And what does he tell us? Everything the ghost said is true. There's the proof, by the way, if we need it. The king is guilty. We don't know up until this point that he's actually guilty. Okay, so how do we see that? What does the king do? He falls down on his knees and he prays. He actually doesn't kneel till the very end of it. But he just, you know, lays everything out. And he kneels at the end. Because he's thinking, maybe I can beg forgiveness of God. Maybe I can say my confession and God will forgive me. And Hamlet comes in and sees him. Now might I do it, Pat. That is, easily starts to pull out his sword. And then what happens? Thought casts a pale, sickly hue over the native hue of resolution. Because what does he start thinking about? He's on his knees, he's praying. I kill him now. Guess what? He dies forgiven. He goes where? Or at the very least, purgatory. Where's Hamlet want him to go? Door number three. He goes, well, that wouldn't be revenge. Dad, is, Dad suffers. And he would, no, no. I got to kill him when? Hamlet says, when he is drunk asleep, line 89, or in his rage, or in the incestuous pleasure of his bed. Catch him in the act with his mother. No. That would be mentally scarred, right? And moreover, who else might be hurt? It's kind of hard with a sword if, you know, Claudius is on top of Gertrude. Oh, sorry, Mom. <laughs> So, Hamlet leaves, and the king gets up. My words fly up, my thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. And those last two lines tell us what? He wasn't sincere. This wasn't a quote-unquote valid confession to God. Why? He's not sorry. He's not contrite. He doesn't have a broken and humble heart, O oh God, thou wilt not despise, Psalm 50, or Psalm 51. Okay? Hamlet could have run him through, and the play would be a three-act play rather than a five-act play. But he doesn't. So he goes up to his mother's room. Okay? 
And what does he do? He starts to go at her. Verbally hammer and tongs. Okay? And she says, line 21, what wilt thou do? Thou wilt not hurt me. Help, help, help. Why does she yell, help, help, if she and Hamlet are the only two people in the room? Hamlet hears behind an heiress, what ho, help, help, help. And he just <laughs> runs him through. Oh, I am slain. Queen, what hast thou done? Hamlet, I know not. Is it the king? And it's not. Hamlet says uh, that he took him for his better. Okay, He takes his mother. He forces her to look at the painting, the portrait of her dead husband. And I think the implication is, you know, she's got a painting like this probably of Claudius. And there's one like this. On the nightstand. And he says, pulls this one up. Look, look, compare the two. And he just really beats at her. And then the ghost comes in. And he's like, yes. And she's like, Hamlet, who are you talking to? Hamlet, don't you see Hamlet? And she's like, ooh, Hamlet. How does he prove he's not mad? Come here. Come on. Take my pulse. Are my eyes rolling around? I got spittle. Okay. So we are going to pick up with page. I hope we get to that before. Um, we're going to pick up with page 1664 on Friday.